chapter 2, and just I want to do a, a bit of a reminder, a bit of an overview. And so I try to leave myself enough time that's perfect uh, to get here. So guys, I want you to get this. I want you to grasp this. Now, listen, I know and I get it. I wouldn't want to hear me preach either. So but what you have to do is understand that even though you may not get something, even though you may not want to listen, man, there may be someone around you that does. So you just have a little bit of respect for them, man, we'll be all right, okay? So we're looking at canceling culture, canceling culture. Now, if you don't know what that means is when we, uh, I've been asking people, do you know what cancel culture is? And they're like, no, I'm like, I don't, you know, what I did. It's when there's a different viewpoint that people have, and instead of discussing things, instead of saying, oh, yeah, what do you believe, and go back and forth and try to figure it out, you just cancel them. You just say, I don't want to hear it. Get out of my line. Forget this. I, I'm shutting off. And um, we are called to, to confront culture. We're, we're called to go out and to be a light and go to the highways and hedges and bring those in that aren't saved, man. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. I'm going to tell you this. I was talking to a boy trying to get him to come to church on Monday. And I'm like, hey, man, do you see everything that's going around? You all know. See, the, the Bible says the wise will understand in the last days, but the, the wicked won't understand. And we, we start to see some of these things come to pass. I'm going to tell you this right now, that we're supposed to be living in a free country. Do you realize we're not living in that right now? That they can shut us down from 10 to 5? You know you're not allowed to go outside your house from 10 to 5? You know they got a curfew? What kind of free country are we living in? We're not. But listen, you say, well, man, that's kind of depressing. That's not depressing because I know the Bible. The Bible says that we got to have a one-world system. they got to have some kind of control over all this. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If you should, I'd spend a couple hours teaching you some prophecy. You guys will start taking this a little bit more serious. Because I'm telling you that trumpet's going to blow one day. It's coming. And you say, how do you know this stuff? Because, man, I'm telling you, you look at the sign. Jesus said, don't look at a time. Don't, instead, look at the sign. Look at the stuff that's going on around in the world. He said, then you'll know. Then he says, lift up your, your, your head to your redemption draw not. And so we look at all this stuff going on. I'm telling you, there's never been a better time to live in this world as a Christian. But we've got to understand we cannot uh, have culture take us over. So what we've been trying to teach about is canceling the culture in our lives. Remember, culture is just basically a group of people boasting about themselves. We have to try to cancel that culture. Last week we looked at a couple things in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. Look at it now. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We're going to look just a couple minutes. I'm going to give you a little bit about uh, review and why we should try to cancel culture then we're going to deal with the lust of the eyes tonight. The lust of the eyes. Like I was saying earlier, I was asking a couple people, hey, what's that mean? What does the lust of the eyes mean? They're trying to bounce it off. And I had to completely erase what I thought it meant. When I say the lust of the eyes, what does that mean? And I'm going to tell you, God opened up a floodgate today. I'm going to hope I get it to you. So let's have one more word of prayer. God, thank you for your holy and awesome and powerful word. And as we read it out loud today, I ask and beg you to teach it to us. The Spirit of God, you got to do that. We read it's comparing spiritual things to spiritual. The Holy Ghost has to teach us this. So I pray you do that. And again, do something mighty and awesome in your house today. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Last week we looked at a couple things out of verse 15. Look at it real quick as a, as a review. He said there was a choice that we all have to make. Love not the world. That's a choice that you and I have to make in our lives. We have to choose not to love the world. It's not something that we can uh, feel good about. It's not something that uh, we have to wait on the feeling. You have to choose not to love the world. That was a choice you have to make. The change that has to take place is in the, the look at the verse, neither the things that are in the world. There has to be a change where the things that we love, when you get born again, again right, as uh, my brother Craggan said, when you get born again, when you truly get saved, you get bought by the blood of Christ, there's a change that takes place that the things in the world do not hold the value that they used to hold. He says you don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. There's a change that takes place, and there's a challenge or a chastisement. He said if any of these things are in you, the love of the Father is not. 
man that, isn't that, just read that again. If any man, look at this, verse 15, look at it. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Wow, that's power. But if you love this world, if you love this present evil world, he said, the love of the Father is not in you. I didn't say it. God said it. He said, well, what? Man, ain't I allowed to have some things? That, like he said, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. There's a chastisement. You have to have a dislike, a, a stepping away from the, from the world system if you're going to have the love of the Father in you. You cannot have both. You cannot ride the fence. Can I say, yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I want to be saved. I mean, if I had, if I raised your hand, who would want to go to heaven? And you're not raising your hand. But if I said, who wants to go to heaven? If anybody didn't raise their hand, you're a fool. But everyone wants to go to heaven when they die. But you think, my goodness, uh, what, what happens if, to, to go to heaven? Hey, you got to accept Jesus. But once you get Jesus in you, you cannot have one foot in the world and one in Christ. He says, you're either going to Dive deep, or you're going to uh, come over here and, and get in Christ. You cannot be in the world and have the love of the Father in you at the same time. That's a sobering thought as I just thought about my life and God just kind of preaching to me. Hey, what, what in the world are you hanging on to that God um, could take away or that's going to stay here? You cannot have the love of the Father. So, uh, why is it important in these last days? I'm telling you. If I were, I was convinced we're in the last days. You say, well, no, wait a minute. I, I, got, I got plans. Well, I'm going to tell you this right now. Jesus ain't waiting for no plans to come back and get us. The trumpet's going to sound one day. And if we can take it as a joke, you can dismiss it out of your life. You can continue to think, oh, I'm just going to live my life however you want. And one day, there's going to be a twinkle of an eye and a snap of a finger, and we're going to go up. And I'm telling you, and he's setting it up. The Antichrist, God's setting it up for the Antichrist to rule and to reign. Heard this today. You ready for this? Do you guys know Biden's slogan? It's build back better. Do you know that that is a slogan that the great reset, the great world reset, it's the same slogan? What's a great world reset? They want to reset the world system to have one system of money, one system. They're trying to reset it. They think coronavirus is the best way. And we've got a chance. Shut down everything, then reset it. So it's just all one system. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what God's going to do. But I'm telling you this right now. One world system, and the Antichrist is going to rule it all. Ten kings, it says, going to get their, it's coming. You better get ready. So these last days, it's important. Listen, it's important that we cancel culture out of our lives. It's one thing to do something because it's right to do. But I'm just going to guess sometimes we don't do things just because they're right to do. It's hard to follow that. But God has another reason. And this is what he gives them. And just if I said this, if I said, don't drive a car fast. If I said, hey, hey, don't drive a car fast. You may think, yeah, that's, I shouldn't drive a car fast. But if I said, hey, don't drive a car fast because you could die. Don't drive a car fast because you can get a leg cut off. You guys pay attention? You guys need to go somewhere else? I'm preaching up there, so watch, okay? So if I say you're trying, don't drive a car, or, yeah, I know, that's kind of why you come to your preaching, so, okay? So you get your leg cut off, you get an arm cut off, you get your face cut off from driving fast. You think, well, I don't want to do that now because of the consequences. Yeah, it's not right to, to speed. We can live by that and say, oh, it's just not right to do, but God sometimes gives us, hey, consequences. Don't do this because of consequences. Look at these consequences. Look at this. We're trying to relay, verse 17 is where I want to go, but listen, it says we're trying to relay these messages to you guys. I've been trying to study, pour my heart into these things, and then pour back out to you because I, I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to uh, 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 get you in despair, but I want to encourage you. These things that you and I try to hang on to, the culture around us, it's going to fall one day. So when these dreams fail that you put in your life, when you say, I'm going to do this because culture says it, I'm going to uh, strive ahead through this culture, when it falls, when it fails, we can understand and be encouraged that the eternal things of this world, of, of God, will remain. See, we see it crashing all around us. Me and my wife, we have decided we're not watching news anymore. Are we serious? If people tell us, that whole, that whole thing about the slogan, my preacher told me that this morning. I had no idea what he was talking about. People were telling me from 10 to 5, we're on real life. I had no idea. Someone told me that. I'm not watching any of our care. It's going to crash. Hey, you guys think this stuff's going to last forever? It's going to fail. It's going to fall one day. It's not going to surprise me the day they say, don't have church no more. That's not going to surprise me. 
I mean, I'm going to try to do my best not to do it, but I'm going to tell you, we've got this mindset that the things that we see is going to last, it is going to fall one day. It's going to fail. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. The things that this world is, it is destined to fall and to fail. It's going to happen. But I want to encourage you when it does, the things of God, the eternal things of God, they're going to remain. These things is what God's calling us to, but we've got to come away from this world. So look at this, look at this verse, look at verse 17. I want you to write down a couple things. These are first on the list. The, the, the things of this world, what, why we can be encouraged. Number one, write this down. The things that, of this world are going to fall. Look at the verse, look at verse 17. It says, the world passeth away. This whole world is, is not just going to pass away, it passeth away. Now some of you are like, man, that's old English stuff. That passeth away. And thou be thy though thum fee fi fo fum, you know. <laughs> you say that's old English stuff. Now that ETH, you know what that ETH means? It's a continual action. So look, one day the world's just gonna go, and you say, Well, I'm not ready for the world to just go, I'm ready for it to uh, uh, but this passive is there's a continual action. It's not just gonna it's gonna go plump one day, but it's done. This old world's passing away. It's continually deteriorating, and it has been ongoing for thousands of years. The more it waxes old, the more rapid it ages. You all ever seen Russ? Yes. Thank you. I do, too. <laughs> he said, yes, on my car. I got it, too. I, we, there's this little Russ spot. I remember I, I, I run my car. This deer ran into my car. And I still ain't forgave him for it. In fact, I killed him because of it. But he ran in my car one day. Y'all, was a joke. You know, saying, come on, loosen up a little bit. And uh, I had to get the front end fixed. And they painted it all up nice. It looked pretty and all this. My hood, they put a new hood on. And they had it all right. And I remember getting that thing home. About six months after I got that thing home, I seen this little rust spot about the size of the end of that pen. And I thought, man, that's not very much. I ain't going to hurt nothing. I was going to take it back to him, but I didn't want to hassle. I said, it's going to be okay. Don't you know that it grew a little bit more to about the edge of this pen? And I'm telling you, once you got to the edge of this pen, that thing started going really fast. It started spreading out. I'm looking all over it. Rust here and rust there. I'm like, come on, man. It's been two or three years. But once that rust started, it started out real small, and it started out real slow. But once it caught hold, and once you've got some rust going, I just bought a truck recently, not too long ago. We started taking some parts apart. I'm telling you, there's rust everywhere on that thing. Now, it's old, but once that rust starts, and you think, man, it's just a little bit, all of a sudden, it just goes boom, and all of a sudden, there's rust everywhere. It's falling apart. That's what this world's doing. Y'all think it's not going to last or it's deteriorating. It started out slow, but now it's passive. It passes away. It is deteriorating. So we place our trust, our time, our talents, on the things of earth too long or too much, you'll get discouraged. You'll get discouraged. You know, uh, me and Adrian are now playing football today. Where we're waiting for the girls to get out of school. There's a little yard and he brings the football and I'm throwing it to him. And man, he's, he can't catch it all, man. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, come on, man. You gotta get, and he's trying to catch, trying to learn to catch, trying to do this thing. And man, I could be like, I want my, my, uh, my boy to be a football star. But man, I'm going to tell you this right now. One, I went to college to be a football star. Y'all know that? I was all state when I was growing up. Come on now. I'm starting to get a little, a little edgy, man. I put a helmet, some shoulder pads on me. I'm sure I'll break my back, you know. <laughs> get it going. But I, I went to all state. Man, I was going to college. I, was going to, I started as a freshman at Muskingum. And I was walking up a hill two weeks before the first practice. Walking up a hill and I blew my knee out. Couldn't walk. I was climbing up. I told this story before. I had to crawl up the rest of the hill, up two flights of stairs, because I didn't have a cell phone, to a, a landline to call my dad and say, man, I can't move. I had to crawl. And three people passed me on the way up and they're like, dude. I'm like, yeah, man, I, I can't walk. Huh, that stinks. Actually, they said something else in college language, but I didn't even say that. They said, man, that's, I'm like, okay, thanks. You know, and I continued to army crawl upstairs. I kid you not, I did it. In an instant, football star, gone. Instantly. No, 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 no. I've got this plan, Lord. No, got, the world is passing away. Guys, listen. You, you can take a hold of something you want to do physically in this world, a sports star, but I'm going to tell you this, and this is awesome. You may fail and fall at those things, but I'm going to tell you, you're always mighty in the sight of God. You're always mighty in the sight of God. 
God wants you. He wants to use you. It don't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your talents or your tra- He says, I'll take you and I'll take something and make something mighty out of you. And a boy knee won't stop it. And who you are, your, your intelligence won't stop it. God says, I can make something mighty out of you. This world passing away. And God says, I will take some of you and use you for something awesome. You're, you're mighty. Number two, not only is it going to fall away, but look at the failure of this world. Look at the failure. Look at verse number 17. It says, the world passeth away. Look at this. And the lusts thereof. Now, if the world's passing away, passeth away, why? Yeah. Well, the lust thereof. Unbridled. The lust is an unbridled passion. The very thing, listen to this, the very thing that you and I get mixed up in is the very thing that is leading and will lead to the fall of this world. And I, may I say, it's also leading to our fall. Let me take you these verses. You're in John, go just a couple, 1 Peter. You're in 2 Peter, 1 Peter, back to the left. Go to 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at this verse. And the failure of this world. See, there, the world's fallen, but look at the failure. It's the lust thereof. You ever wonder why there are bad people? One guy told me one time, he said, there ain't a bunch of bad people. There's only one bad person in the world. They just move around. He just moves around a lot. You think, well, what about all this stuff, man? What about, why is this? God really good and all this stuff happens? Yeah, there's failure that's happened. The lust, unbridled passion. It's in all of us. It's causing the world to reel to and fro. It's going to pass away one day. What you see, it says it's going to burn up with a fervent heat. There ain't going to be nothing left in this old world. It's passing away. The failure of it is this lust. Look at this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. He says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never, what's it say? Fall. See, the calling is your calling out of this world. You're elected to the office of heaven. They held a vote, and if you're saved, you're elected to, the, to heaven. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they held a vote, and if you're saved, you're elected to heaven. Amen. Amen? I mean, he said, your calling is, you've got to call out of the world. He said, if you remember that you're called out of this world, you remember that you're elected to heaven, they held a vote, and the angels of heaven said, he's allowed in because he's got the blood of Christ over him. I'm telling you, you're elected to heaven. He said, you'll never fall if you remember that. Grab a hold of that thought, and grab and keep it to you. He said, due diligence to do that. There's a calling, an election. There's a failure of this world. This world fallen. It's fallen. There's a failure. Number three, write this down. Verse 17. Now you see the freedom that happens. Verse 17. Okay, go back to 1 John. 1 John chapter number uh, 2, verse 17. It says, The world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Seeing these things come to pass, they bring, it brings people into the bondage of fear. You, you think maybe, just think of this. You ain't got no hope for tomorrow. You don't got no hope. You say, what's going on in, in this country? What's going on in this just craziness that they're locking us down? China may attack us, and I never heard that before. See, I got news from Brian. Is that, and what's going on? Hey, you could be in fear. I know there's people that won't come out of their house. They're so scared of this thing. Man, they're so scared of coronavirus. They won't come out of their house. They're in the bondage of fear. But I will tell you, not us. We shouldn't be. John 8, 36 says, The Son will make you free. says, You shall be free indeed. <laughs> John 8, 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, we have a freedom. We don't have to be in the bondage of fear. We have to live in fear. Yes, the world's passing away. Yes, what you see is not going to be here one day. Yes, it's all going away. The failure and the fall of this world is gone. But we don't have to fear we have a freedom. We're going to abide forever. You don't have to be a slave to this world. Now you got to break free from Egypt. That's what the children of Israel did. They broke free from Egypt. You say, I can't cry out to God. He wants to hear you. He'll send a deliverer to you. You aren't a slave to this world to live and die as it passes away. You've been granted a new life to live. Jesus said, I've come to give life and to give it more abundantly. Listen to this. I got this written down. It is this thought. Listen. You can either live in a land and the culture dying of it, or you can cancel culture and really live. You can live in the land where culture is and die in it, or you can 
cancel culture and really live. We talked a couple weeks about abortion, canceling culture, wicked evil, destroying of little babies in the womb. I seriously, seriously consider bringing videos of abortions and letting you watch them. But I probably had to get permission from parents before I would. It's worse than a, a horror movie. You watch that little baby getting mutilated and sucked through a straw. Enough, enough, enough. I mean, it's bad. Well, I know. That's enough. But some of these kids don't know anything about it. All they know is a choice. It's all they're told. Oh, I, <clears throat> a woman's choice. Her body. Yeah, I know. Can you hear it? So it's all, you think, they don't get anywhere else. Gotta get it. We talk about that. We got to cancel that out of our lives. We've been praying for abortion to end in America. And begging God to end this wicked practice of us sacrificing. Last week we looked at the lust of the flesh. This flesh that you and I have, there's a lust, and an unbridled lust, and not the, that which is forbidden, we want to grab a hold of. This flesh tries to, we want it, we go after it, and we seek after it, and our world revolves around it, because may that lust, and, and, and we try to curb that, try to cancel it, try to die to self. And today we're going to look at this thing called the lust of the eyes. Look at verse 16, look at verse 16, we try to teach this to you. Verse 16 says, for all that is in the world, this is everything. He says, you can lump all that is in the world, all that is in our culture. You can lump it in these three things. He said, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So what is the lust of the, of the eyes? Well, like I said, lust is an unbridled lust for the forbidden. We talk about eyes, obviously. Uh, Boom, those things, right? You're like, it's like those things. You're like, well, what, what do your eyes look like? Well, I have no idea. And you're like, you know, you pop one out and look at all the eyes. You know, the, the eyes, what is this? <clears throat> Write this down. This is just, oh, I think I put this on the paper. This was just something that popped in my head. It's a lens by which the world makes sense. It's the lens by which the world makes sense. Now, we see things physically. We see things physically, okay? I look out at you guys, and I see you physically, right? Spiritual eyes is how we see them. So physical eyes is I see cold. Spiritual eyes is how do I see cold? Do I see them as a soul? Do I see them as, what do I see? And when you guys look out, when we see things, there's two types. Either it's a... You're looking at a physical or a spiritual. Sometimes our spiritual eyes, or I'm sorry, sometimes our physical eyes makes things appear to be right only to prove that they're actually wrong. Y'all ever seen this thing before? You seen this? Which one's bigger? Which one? Red. Okay. Which one's bigger? Red. What? It's like I know. Some of you know the trick. I, but which one looks bigger? Red. Red. Not green. The red. The red. Not the green. Look. Red. <laughs> They're the same. You're like, I know some of you know the trick. They're being ornery. But you see how our eyes are deceiving? Do you see how we can see things? You think, no, 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 my eyes, they never tricked me. They never deceived me. Are you kidding me? Y'all, I, I was going to get some optical illusions. There's some pretty cool ones. And they, they showed one at a table. And it was amazing. They said, which of these tables is longer? And I'm telling you, one table looked like it was long, and the other looked like it was fat. And they said, it's the same exact table. They just situated some things differently. It was amazing. Our eyes play tricks on us. Our physical eyes. Uh, sometimes our, uh, those things... We will look at something and say, this is right, but it's really wrong. So what would the lust of the eyes be? If I was going to say, what um, what do you think the lust of the eyes are? Now, I asked my wife this before I came to church, and she's like, I can't remember, but she is sinful. <laughs> I don't know. She's like, she's trying to tell me, and I thought, man, I, I, I paced the floor in the kitchen today. Everybody got out of the, the, the church. Everybody was gone, and uh, about 2 o'clock, noon service, and I paced the floor. My God, you've got to reveal this to me. I don't know what this is. I can teach it like a, you see something, but I don't think it is. 
Now, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, what's the difference? Because if my flesh wants something and I see it, that's a lust of the flesh. What's the difference between that and the lust of the eyes? I think a lot of the answer lies in Genesis chapter 3. So let's turn over there. Genesis chapter 3. What is the lust of the eyes? Because I think for us to understand how we have to cancel it out of our lives, we have to understand what it is. What is the lust of the eyes? Remember, a lust is an unbridled lust for the forbidden. It's forbidden. Genesis chapter number 3. I want you to look at three verses, 5 through 7. Familiar, but watch these verses. The lust of the eyes. And we'll look at it. Give you three three, uh, points. First of all, this is after Eve. Eve is um, confronted with Satan. If you're ever confronted and Satan starts talking to you, do you all know what you should do? Flee. Flee! Some people are like, I'll quote scripture. Don't do that. It'll put them right back in your face. Flee from it. Get out of there. Eve never did that. Now look what happens here. Verse 5. It says, For God doth know that in the day to eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and didn't eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he didn't eat. And the eyes of them both were open. Isn't that amazing? Now, wait a minute. I know this, that if my eyes are looking at something, they're open. I can't see nothing from doing this. Wow, that's an awesome tree. And he's like, oh, just eat it, and your eyes will be open. Oh, where's it? Oh, there it is. Oh, wow. That's awesome. What in the world is he talking about? This is the lust of the eyes. Ready? Write this down. Write number one. Write principle. Here's the principle of it. God creates something, everything, for a purpose. God creates something, everything, for, the, for a purpose. This is the principle. Now watch this. Listen. Satan, the world culture, wants us to see, I got that in quotations, wants us to see it another way. See, Satan does this. Satan says, yes, that is what God created. Yes, that is what he did. And this is what it was. There's a purpose in it. There's a principle to it. He made it for a reason. But then Satan says, there's something missing in it. There's something you ain't getting. There's something that God hasn't revealed to you yet. Something God's holding back. He said, you get your eyes open. You can't see everything yet. Even though God made you perfect, Eve. Y'all know Eve was made perfect. Even though he made you perfect, God, uh, Eve, uh, God is holding something back. Your eyes are not completely open yet. Take your Bible. I want you to do this because i got to share this to you. And hold your place here. Go to Luke chapter number 14. I think it's 14. I don't know where I wrote this verse down there. Luke chapter, it's somewhere over here. Everybody got it on there in their page? No. Oh, where is that at? How come I didn't write that down? Luke, I know it's Luke. It's 21. Well, wait, 21. Luke 21, yes. I don't know where I got that at. Look at this. This is, what did you say, 26? No, that's not it. Oh! Lord, you're going to have to show me this because I don't know where it's at. Uh, just a second, guys. Sorry. i got to show you this. Well, you wouldn't do this, wouldn't you? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, 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 no. I know I wrote this down here. Where did I write it down at? Well, go to Luke 14, because that's the verse that came up in my head. Let me see if I can find it. I got my phone, so I can't look it up. What is it? Uh, your eye is single. Look that up. Sorry, I have no idea. I know I wrote this down with a pen on my piece of paper here somewhere, and it's gone. Just I search out eye single. 11, 11. Okay, I was just three verses off. I didn't pray three extra times, three chapters. Oh, okay, Luke, what is it? What's the verse? 34. 34. Everybody turn your Bibles. Okay, sorry about that. I'm allowed to make mistakes every once in a while, ain't Thank you, man. Luke 11, 34. Now watch this. Hey, everybody pay attention now. Watch this. We're just going to be good. Yeah, we're going to be good. Okay. 
Verse 34. Listen to this. Jesus said this. The light of the body is the eye. Now that's where people get this. That's where people get this. Someone want to sit over there by these guys. And someone, a dog or someone. You guys are just driving me crazy. Man. Sorry. I'm, the devil's going to try to stop this thing. And I want to stop this thing. And you're distracting people in front of you and beside you. So just got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> I'm just getting, I'm, I can't get in the rhythm because they keep playing and doing all that stuff. All right. Luke chapter number 11 says, 34, he says, the light of the body is the eye. So y'all ever heard the eye is the window to the soul? Y'all ever heard that before? Yeah. Okay. That's where they get this verse. Now, I don't mean nothing because that ain't what Jesus is trying to say. But watch what it says. Therefore, when the, thine eye is single. Now that's kind of strange, isn't it? How many of you here got two eyes? How many of you just got one? Okay, a couple of you. Okay, sorry about that. All right, but he said if your eye is single, he's not about if you got two or one. I said it to him. He said, "Watch, your eye be single. Thy whole body also is full of what? Light. But when thine eye is evil, well, if it's single, it's light. When it's evil, that means it's got another one. That means that." Not only is there an eye, there's another eye somewhere. That's strange, because then you'd be like, what is in there, forehead? <laughs> you know, yeah, that's evil, man. What is that talking about? Well, what's his head? When thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. He said, when you have an, an eye and it's single, he said, your body is full of light. When it's when it's evil, when it's got more than one, he said it is full of darkness. There is no light in it. Now go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. Let me show you this. This rock my world today, just thinking about what the lust of the eyes is. So God made everything perfect. God said this is the principle of it. He said, I made these things. Satan's telling Eve, look, uh, uh, you eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened in verse number five. He said, eat this and your eyes will be opened. Now wait a minute. He's like, my eyes already open. This is the whole point. God says this, your eye is single. You've got that Eve eye. You only got one eye open. You haven't had your eyes open yet. He said, you're full of light. But when it gets evil, when that other eye gets open, as it did to Adam and Eve, he says, that's where the problem comes in. So the principle is this. Uh, the Satan, he takes what God is, has done. He says, here, you've made this thing perfect. Here, you've made this thing good. Here, this is what this was made for. And he tries to twist it. And this is how he does it, right? Write this in A. Well, number one, he tries to distract you. He tries to distract you. Look at Genesis chapter 3, look at verse number 5. This is what Satan's telling you. For God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be open. Now, he starts to pull this away. He starts to distract you. He says, look, God made Eve perfect, but he starts to tell her there's something else missing. You can't see everything. She's a perfect human being. But somehow he starts to distract her from, away from what she was made for to try to get her to get her eye evil, to start for her eyes to be open. He distracts, then he divides. He says, uh, Eve, uh, you could be as a god. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up watching some of those old... Y'all ever grew up watching those old Greek movies where they weren't made very good and they walk around like clay statues? Anybody ever seen anything like that? Uh, you know. Okay, I'm too old. But anyway, they used to make these... And, and, and y'all know the Greek god Zeus and all that stuff? I mean, how many of you wouldn't want to have lightning where you can just strike anything you want? Anybody? Thank you, J.O. Oh, thank you, your couple of you. Yeah, no, but I mean, you just like take light and be like, oh yeah, I got your butt, and boom, wow, that'd be awesome. You go, hey, you know what he did? He distracted and he started to divide them. Do you realize they had perfect harmony with the God of heaven? All powerful. He starts to divide them. He distracts, he divides. Them. And watch this, this is amazing to me. He makes them come to a decision. Watch this. Watch your first five. He says, for God doth know that they eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I just want to tell this to you. You ready for this? They already knew what good was. 
Eve was perfect. She already knew what good was. She didn't have to make a decision what was evil and good. She already knew what good was. And Satan said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to distract you, I'm going to divide you, but I'm going to make you make a decision you never had to make. This is the principle. This is where Satan brings us to a point where he's trying to make our eyes evil. He's trying to get these unbridled, these forbidden things of our eyes. And watch it, we'll check it to you in a second. But the principle of it is this. Just if anything you get this, the principle is God made everything good. He made everything a certain way. He said, this is perfect, this is the way it should be, and what the Satan is trying to do is he's trying to get us distracted, he's trying to get us divided and make a decision about that thing we never should have had to make. Number two, write this, right? You don't only see the principle, but now you see the perversion. You see the perversion. Verse number six, watch it. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and watch, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. What once was a single eye, seen of one way. Seen how God made it. He was single eye. That's what, that's what Jesus is talking about. When your eye is single, your body's full of light. You see it one way. God made it this way. He made it perfect. This is the way it's supposed to be. He said, I'm trying to switch that and try to pervert it. Do you realize that Satan is a pervert? I mean that. You say, that's an awful hard word. No, 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 it isn't. It's exactly what he does. He takes what's supposed to be avoided and then makes us have an attempt to get it. I wrote this and he said, he takes what's an innocent and then makes it infected. Holy makes it hellish. The command of God to a carnal use, that which is precious to a problem. The devil is trying to pervert all the things that God has made. The lust of the eyes is you and I fall for it. When we have the lust of the eyes, we fall for what God has made good and it's perversion of what devil's trying to make it. Say, what are all those things? I'll get to that in a second. But that's what you see happen in the garden. Hey guys, let me tell you this right now. That little tree set up in the midst of the garden, that was an awesome tree. I, 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 just in my mind, I'm thinking of growing through church and they're preaching about this tree in the midst of the garden. I'm thinking, man, that's an awful tree. No, it's not. God made it good. It was awesome. God made it for a specific purpose. He said, no, you don't touch it. It's made there for a purpose and a principle that I don't want it to be perverted. And Satan said, I want to pervert that and twist it and make it something it was never supposed to be. They weren't supposed to eat that tree. And he perverted it. Made it into something it wasn't supposed to be. The devil's trying to do that. The things you're supposed to avoid, he wants you to attempt to get them. You're not supposed to be looking at stuff. You're not supposed to be saying those things. God made your mouth. What in the world is those things coming out of your mouth for? You get what I'm saying? He made your eyes. What are they watching for? See, God made them for a specific reason. He perverts it everything. He perverts everything. Now watch the problem. Number three, the problem. Watch verse number seven. <clears throat> this was amazing to me. The eyes of them both were open. Now were they closing their eyes the whole time? New. Instead, what you find this, right? The eyes, they were single eyes. They seen God made things a certain way and was supposed to be made that way. Satan perverted it, and all of a sudden there was another eye open to them that was never supposed to be open. He said, The eyes of them both were open, much, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. One, listen, once one thing is twisted in your mind about what God made, the other things about your life will be too. See, that fruit was never supposed to be eaten. It was twisted. He perverted it. He made it something it was never supposed to be. And then all of a sudden, they look around, there's other things that were never supposed to be twisted in their mind, and they're starting to put the things together like, what happened here? I'll tell you what happened. Go to uh, Titus. Titus chapter 1. You don't have to go there. If you can make it, you can stay right there. If you can't turn there, don't try Titus chapter 1, watch this. This verse makes so much sense now. Oh my goodness. Titus chapter 1, Lord, you got to help. You got to help me get this. Titus 1 15 says this. Listen. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. That's when we can't sit through a, a simple class and I say certain words. 
And if you, you get, when I say the words, you kind of like, you, your, your mind's twisted. That was taking a mind that was perfect and God created in the mother's womb one day. And he took your body and formed it. And the devil's twisted that thing. He's took it and he said, I don't want that to be godly no more. I'm going to open their eyes to something else. He's twisted it up. You're never supposed to see the things at your age that you've seen in your life. Never meant for you to see them. And yet he's twisted that. Your eyes are open, and that lust of the eyes is now a part of who you are. And then to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, it's nothing pure. And he's took it. The problem is that, man, now that that one thing's twisted, now everything's twisted. You want to know what's amazing and heartbreaking at the same time? Genesis chapter 3. I know I'm turning back and forth, but watch this. Verse number 7 says, The eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they stood faithfully together, made themselves aprons. See, that one thing twisted. Now everything's twisted. Now the things that God has made perfect, now they're no longer perfect. They can use, be used for something else. And they're struggling with this. And watch verse 8. It says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. They got to a point where they were so twisted that even the voice of God was something they didn't want to hear. It's just heartbreaking to me. There's a generation growing up in our country that they're so twisted in their minds and sin has overrun them. And the devil's had their way with them, whatever reason, that they don't even want to hear the voice of God anymore. We're growing up with a generation just like that. That's the problem with this. What's the lust of the eyes? The lust of the eyes is when God made something perfect and we look at it and our eyes are open and we make it something other than what God intended it to be. Marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman. Now in the United States of America, two men and two women can get married legally. How awful we have made that. God never intended it. God said, I, I intended it. That's what he made perfect, but we twisted it. The lust of the eyes, we've take, we taken what God has said is holy and just and good, and we twisted it and made it something we wanted. Gender. You know, we just elected, not ain't official yet, president and vice president said that you guys, children, can pick their gender up to 10 years old. God made you who you are. He made you a man, he made you a woman. A boy and a girl from the day you were born. But the world, the devil tries to twist it. Make it. The lust of the eyes calls us to think that somehow that God didn't make it perfect, that we're missing something. That No, 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 God, you don't know exactly what you're doing, so there's something else behind it. He's taken it, the curiosity of people and he's twisted it. How about you? He's made you perfect. As I look at you, there's all kinds of different people. Don't be trying to be someone else. We look at these magazines, and we look at these pictures of these people on our phones. We long to be like them instead of longing to be like God made you. He made you. The lust of the eye causes us to take what God has made perfect and twist it. Say, there's something missing. There's something else I could be. You don't got to dress like the world. You don't got to dress like that movie star. They don't know what they're doing anyway. You can quote me on that one, man. Hollywood? Rock stars? Pop stars? I don't even know the names of them anymore. I don't really care. They don't do nothing to me, but we try to take them and idolize them and say, this is who I need to be. No, God made them who they are supposed to be, and God made you who you're supposed to be. Why are you trying to be like someone else? So I'm just trying to find my... No, no, no. The only way you're going to find your true identity is if you find out who God is. Ask Him who you're supposed to be. Don't let the devil twist it. Don't let the lust of the eyes grab a hold of you. Don't get caught up trying to change yourself to be someone else. You're important to God. You're important to me. Hey, listen. You're important to the church. You're important to this world. It would, the world would not be the same if you weren't here. Do you realize that? Would be the same. God says wine. People try to twist that thing. Alcohol, I preach on that a little bit. I say, ah, I'm okay, drink it, whatever. Twist it, turn it. The lust of the eyes calls us to do that. Don't let the devil or even yourself pervert what God has made. He's made it perfect. 
He made it just the way it's supposed to be. He said, this is what I placed it on the earth to be. Don't let the devil twist it. Don't let the lust of the eyes and your eyes be open. He said, make your eyes single. God said, this is the way it's supposed to be. Just accept that the way it's supposed to be. Don't think he's hiding anything from it. Don't make your eye evil. He said, if your eye is evil, your whole body is evil. And unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Look at what God has made. The face value has made it single. So how do we cancel the culture in our life? Three quick points. Have we done ready? How do we cancel how do we cancel this? Number one, choose what you look at. Choose what you look at. Hebrews 12, 2 says this. <clears throat> Looking unto Jesus. And I want you to do with your eye. Look. He says, looking unto Jesus, the altar and finish of the Look unto him. Hebrews chapter number 11. How do I look unto Jesus? Hebrews chapter number 12, 2. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 10. Choose what you look at. Next time you're tempted, next time you find yourself trying to twist what God says, next time you find yourself trying to take what God has made and make it something else for your desires, for your lusts, he says, look at Jesus. Look at 11 verse, 11, chapter 11, verse 10. Through faith also Sarah received Herself receives strength and sees seed. I'm sorry, wrong one. Sorry, verse 10. That's verse 20. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham looked for a foundation of a city not made with hands. And man, you know, I can look at this world and I can twist it around, and you all can look at this world and you can lust after it and lust and have this purpose this lust that's forbidden to twist it so that you can partake of it. But he said, when you get to a place where you need to cancel this in your life, look to Jesus and then look to the future, the foundation, not made with hands, eternal into heaven. That's what Abraham looked for. Do you realize that one day you're all going to die? This world's not our home. Praise God, it's not our home. What an evil wicked place we'd have to stay and live in if it was our home. He said, look for a foundation whose builder and maker is God. Titus 2.13 says you look for the blessed hope. Now you ain't got this yet. Some of you ain't got this yet. I don't know when you're going to get it in your life. I understand it. I get it. But some of you ain't got this yet. You say, what's a blessed hope? A blessed hope is when one day you're going to look up and Jesus is going to be coming. It says all eyes are going to see him one day. But that blessed hope is as we're trying to trudge through this wicked, awful, evil world that the devil's twisted and turned and made something completely different from what God has made. That there's going to be one day he's going to come through that cloud. He's going to say, will you come on up? And I'm going to say, good. I'm going to look down. I'm going to see my wife come up with me. I'm going to see my kids come up with me. I'm going to say, praise God, there's a blessed hope. Now, you all ain't got this yet. Or you'd be crying along with me. But there's going to be a day, and he's going to do that. And some of you are going to be left here. And that's going to be sad. Because you're going to be all alone. And you're going to be wondering why. You're going to be thinking, no, 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 no. That guy up there preaching, no, 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 no. This ain't, none of this ain't no truth. I can't know. We're going to be gone. That blessed hope, he's come back one day, he's going to get us. I don't want you to be left here. That's why I preach the way I do. That's why I have passed. That's why I dig into these scriptures hours after hours to bring something to you because I want you to understand. I don't want you to be left here. That blessed hope, the longer I'm here, the more blessed it is. <laughs> and I know I'm 40. And you're all like, you're just old and you got that. I'm not old. I got to run old you. I'll, 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 uh, we'll go on track. I'll show you. I'm not old. I just realized, I think it was this year, Corona year, 2020, I worry too much about it because this ain't my home. 
I'm going to fly away one day. Hey, I don't want you to be left here all night. Some of your parents may go up and you may stay here. How awful would that be? But there's a blessed hope coming. Look for that. 2 John 1 8 says, Look inside, look at yourself. You write that down. I got it wrote down. He said, Look at yourself. You know the, the, the common denominator with all these things? These are solid, unmoving, unchanging things. Jesus is unmoving. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, that foundation whose builder and maker is God is never going to be shook by an earthquake and never be burned up. A turbine can't burn that foundation. It's a foundation that's laid. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And Abraham said, I'm looking for that, that building, that foundation whose builder and maker is God. It's a move was unshakable. That blessed hope, you can try to stop it. You can say it's not going to happen. You can say, there's no way it's happening in my lifetime, but he's going to, he's going to break through that eastern sky one day. And then you're going to wish you hadn't said that. Look at this one. John, or Luke, go to Luke chapter 21. Watch this. Now, this is awesome. Luke 21. I don't even know what time it is on this. <clears throat> Luke 21. Oh, yeah. Okay. Luke 21. Watch this. Choose what you look at. When you choose what you look at, say, I'm not going to look at these things and say, I'm going to cancel that out of my life. I'm going to choose. I'm going to look at Jesus. I'm going to look at that blessing. I'm going to look at that foundation. At, look at myself. 1 John 1 8. Look at Luke 21, verse 26. Boy, it's a rock your world. It says, Men hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. He said, There's going to be such a shaking in the powers of the heavens. There's going to be so much stuff that goes up on this earth that people are going to be, their, their hearts are going to fail. They're going to die of heart attacks because they're afraid of what they're looking at on this world. And now look at verse number 28. At the same time, it says, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption draw by. At the same time, the men will be dying from their hearts failing from looking at what's going on in this world going, I can't believe that this is happening in my world right now. There's going to be people looking up going, come on. Bring it on, Jesus. The same people. Come. From redemption, draw it back. We're not going to be scared of this old world because we have a foundation that's never going to be shaken. And I hope that's you. Choose what you look at. Man, I could preach that a little bit more, but I won't. Number two, change how you look at it. Change how you look at it. 2 Corinthians 10 7 says that, you can write down 1 Samuel, I think 16 3, says God doesn't look on the outward, he looks at the inward. Stop, seeing, stop, stop looking at the outward of what's going on. I know coronavirus. I know all this stuff. And I know this. I get it. I know this. That when I stop looking at what's going on the outward with what's going on, and all these people, I'm reminded of this. this the governors, the principalities, the powers that be, they can do whatever they want. I just remember this verse. Jesus said, there is no power but of God. And he's in power. He's in control. When we stop looking at the outward and start looking at the inward, stop looking at what's going on on the outward and realize there's a battle that goes on for souls, man. There's a battle. Do you realize if we could see the heavens right now, the sword fight going on for the souls of men? We could see what's going on as Satan's angels are attacking and Michael's going and they're battling back and forth because someone don't want to pay attention. Someone don't want to get in the Word. Someone don't want to listen to God speaking to them. They're trying to resist it and the devil's like, yeah, resist it. Don't listen to that God. There's another battle of these angels fighting back at them. If we could just see, it would change your mind about all this. But we can't. Realize there's something going on that we can't see and the outward doesn't show it. He says, change how you look at them. Choose what you look at. Cancel this culture in your life. Choose what you look at. Change how you look at them. And right, ready for this? Number three, chase. Chase after those things. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And Colossians chapter 3, I've got to be done, says this, ready? It says, If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. We have to chase after it. So how do I cancel the lust of the eyes of me flipping these things around that God said are made for a specific reason, but yet the world and culture has changed them to be something different? Chase after what God says is good and right. Philippians 4, verse 7. Is that one right? Or is it 8? 4, 8 
says whatsoever things are true, just, and right, think on those things. Chase after them. Say, what about these things? What about, what about what's going on in the world? I'm going to tell you what. Today has been one of the greatest days of my life in the past six months. You know why? I haven't done a thing to look at news. <laughs> I, I got on Twitter, because I got a Twitter account. Amen. Come on now. I tweet out a picture of my boy, Adley, with a reindeer guy he's got on tonight, jingles and things. And I said, Merry Christmas. I said, I know it's a little early. But man, it's sure good to get on here and see things that are good and right instead of things that are just horrible and awful. What? I always say that it's never too early to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Amen. Chase after him, guys. Cancel the culture in your life. Cancel the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes. God's made you. He made you for something awesome. Don't let the devil twist it around. Make you think you're something that you're not. Every head bowed in my clothes. Father, thank you for your holy and mighty awesome word. And God, I know that there's a battle right now for the souls of men and women, boys and girls. So if everyone just head bowed and eyes closed, no one talking, no one looking about, ask yourself this question. Seriously. In the deepest, darkest part of your heart, ask yourself this question. Do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? How awful would it be for you to leave this place and not be saved? You're not saved, you're dying and going to hell. What an awful way to leave. Ask yourself the question, do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Every head bowed, every eye closed. You shouldn't be, shouldn't be messing. I always know this, during invitation, if you can't sit still, that's probably because God's trying to get hold of you. So why don't you sit still and listen? Maybe you'll hear something. Do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? And if you don't know, why don't you let us talk to you? We're not going to baptize you. You're not going to join the church. But you say right now, in this quietness of this moment, hey, I don't know for sure. Would you pray for me? Don't worry about who's around you. You say, right now, God's speaking to me. I don't know what it is, but God's speaking to me. And you don't know you're saved. Anybody just say, well, I don't know I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Lift your hand up. Thank you. I'll pray for you. Anybody else say, well, I don't know I'm saved. Anybody else? Just ask a prayer. Thank you. I'll pray for you. I will. It's okay. All right. Anybody else? Now listen to me. Watch this prayer. Listen to this prayer. Ready? God, I thank you. These hands have been raised. But we can raise them and ask for prayer, and that's what I'm doing. I'm praying for these souls that raise their hand. They don't know they're going to heaven. The devil wants them to stay right where they are. Right where they are. They, he wants them to stay right there. Don't move. Don't do anything different. That way he can take them to a devil's hell just like he's called. God, you're more powerful than he is. It says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So I'm asking now, by the power of Jesus Christ in his name, that you break and bind every spirit. God, I pray your spirit will move right now. If you raised your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand. You need to get saved. Why don't you do this? Don't fight. My wife, Sydney, be in the back. You can say, well, I need to get saved. Everybody say, five bow down eyes closed. Why don't you just get up out of your seat? Find them in the back. They'll be standing back there. You get up, they'll get up with you. And you say, I need to get saved. I want to get saved. I want to know I'm going to heaven. And I'm going to get it settled tonight. Come on. That's all I got to do. Jump up. Fine. They'll be standing back there. You jump up. Don't jump up. I'm not going to make you come up front. I'm make you in the back. Come on. You know God's working on you. Just get up. Anybody? I'm going to force you. You got to make that decision. Come on. Pray for me. Father, right now I just want to ask as your cha- as this challenge is given to us as we start an altar call, as we start, people come forward to pray. I, God, I'm just begging you that we find this lust of the eyes in our life. See how we twisted things of God and made them something they're not. May we repent of it, cancel it in our life. God, may you be glorified. 
This invitation is given. God, I pray that you be glorified. God, I ask you to do something mighty in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go.